I think addressing violence is one important mechanism, but we are really interested if we do this study in child physical and primarily mental well-being. I think that's overall our, our target, what we're interested in, in terms of the dynamics. And so, the ultimate idea is to do this at scale. Harry was asking the question, how many? Maybe 1,200 per side, maybe 1,500 per side. This is still to be decided exactly what the sample size would be. But the idea would be 12,000 children born in 2021, and representing basically all areas in the world of children born at the beginning of the 21st century, and then seeing how long we can continue what we can learn from this study. And so what we did over the last 18 months was a pilot study. We just tried to figure out whether that's doable at all. And, and really what I'm going to talk about in the next half an hour or so, 20 minutes, is trying to show you what we have achieved, what we've done. And, uh, and, and, and some of it will be um, quite down to earth, right, trying to give you an impression of what we've been up to over the last, uh, over the last two years. So just very briefly so that you understand um, the basic activities that are behind the report that you're seeing. Um, the EBLS foundational study really has two main pillars. One is the needs and resources assessment that we will be looking at after the lunch break, which is reflecting the policy side primarily of the study, namely trying to better understand what are the needs and the resources in different sites in EBLS and how could we think about doing this better. I want to mention one thing here that when was not yet mentioned explicitly that in doing this we've been working quite closely with the Global Partnership and with WHO and we adopted the INSPIRE framework that Alex showed in doing this needs and resources assessment across the world because we think that this is a useful framework to help bridge the activities in the cities with the activities of the Global Partnership and WHO and find synergy between these different activities. And the other element was to understand whether this Global Birth Court study is feasible and to try to do this through a foundational survey or pilot survey. Well, 1,200 participants is a little bit big for a pilot study. It's not what usually one understands by a pilot study. But for, in our context, it's kind of like a, a 10 to 1 size um, uh, test, whether uh, we, it's a, kind of like a stress test. And so, so what I will be focusing on now is just this pilot survey side. And, and the other side we will be looking at um, later on. What was the goal of this pilot study, of, of the foundational survey? Basically, the idea was to test all the major components that are, need to be in place in order to conduct such a complex study. And so this starts with mundane things like, can we sort out the contracts? And just to mention the contracts, this is an easy thing if you have just one funder, one study site. But once you start doing this with eight study sites, many other universities, in the end, you end up having 13 different contracts. And they all need to be managed and completed and executed. It's quite a lot of work. Ethical approval, translation, field work, coordinator, training, participant and recruitment, and as you go down this timeline, then ultimately we also built into the study, which was not initially planned, a recontact again of the participants. Initially we thought in 18 months it would be unrealistic to do a second wave, but then, I don't know, in some crazy moment we decided, well, let's try to do this as well. And we've added this component of actually recontacting the participants so that we can demonstrate that we are able to maintain the cohort over time. Uh, of course, with limitations. I think one of the important things that you need to bear in mind is when it comes to the timeline, and I think that's one of the things that we've learned, when it comes to the timeline of the foundational survey, here you see the period, the 18 months, for which we had 
funding support for which we are very grateful. This is the, this 18 month period. I think it's important to understand that realizing this study was only possible because we had quite a lot of planning time before the official start of the study. So this was preparation, ethics commission, contracts and so on design. Then there was the 18 month study but as you will be seeing in a moment, we're just about to complete data collection. And if you want to capitalize on all the data that have been collected, a lot of the activities will be continuing beyond the official end of the study. And that is in all studies, but I think particularly in longitudinal studies, that's one of the big challenges that you have. Uh, you need to plan also for activities after you've completed the data collection. As we developed the study, we started thinking about the thematic focus of this particular pilot study. So we haven't been trying to cover everything in the study. And so we worked towards a framework to analyze our data. It's not going to be the only framework. But one of the questions that seemed to us to be really important was the link between maternal exposure to intimate partner violence during pregnancy and child outcomes in the first years, uh, first months of life. This relationship as a relationship, as a correlation association is very well known. There are many studies that have looked at this relationship. I think it's a relationship that's under recognized when it comes to policy making because I think there is still a little bit of a tribal thinking of violence against children on the one hand and violence against women on the other hand. But I believe that Looking at this during pregnancy really makes it clear also for policymakers that you need to think across these boundaries. So this is basically very well known that we thought we could add to the evidence by really asking the question, what are the mediating mechanisms that link maternal exposure to intimate violence to poor child outcomes? I will not go through these different options, but I think one of the important things that we want to contribute to is to go beyond risk factors and to think about causal mechanisms. And I think Pasco already <coughs> alluded to the importance of better understanding causal mechanisms. This graph just shows you some of the instruments that we have been developing. One of the things I believe, again, that I just want to emphasize is that in such a big study, it is absolutely essential that you, when you develop instrumentation of such a study and you have a very extensive consultation process. So just so that you all understand how this works, you have an initial list, you invite everybody to contribute to this initial list of constructs. You go from the initial list of constructs to actually operationalizing and proposing different instruments and then you need to go to, through several rounds. We all went through several rounds of thinking about what matters most, what is important to us until we eventually arrived at an instrument that, for instance, includes um, measures of prenatal attachment, it includes measures of perceived stress, well-being, depression, um, intimate partner violence, and, and so on. Attitudes towards corporal punishment, we thought that's important to measure before the child is born, so that we understand something about the expectations of the mother. Not necessarily, that attitudes directly translate into behavior. We know that this is not the case, but to better understand something about the cultural normative context into which the child is eventually born. You will also see that we've made an attempt, an important attempt in our view, to take biological samples. So we took hair samples, you could see this in the short video, and we took dry blood spots, primarily again in terms of analytes focusing on biomarkers of exposure to stress. Because that seemed to be the main causal mechanism if you think about the um, model that I showed you, that we could afford to measure, partly also collecting biosamples was a proof of concept exercise, just showing whether we can do this to high standards and ship the biosamples and actually do the analysis. In such a big study, translation is a big challenge. I just want to point this out, that once you have, you have an instrument, you go through another long phase of trying to achieve high quality translation. We adopted the WHO guide, uh, framework to do the translations. 
It's a framework which I personally quite like because it's not a forward translation, backward translation framework, but it is a framework that is focusing on two separate independent forward translations and then resolving conflicts between the two translated versions. And, and so, so we went through this process in all the sites and we translated into 10 languages. One is missing, I believe, but Afrikaans, Iksosa, Romanian, Urdu, Sinkala, Tamil, Vietnamese, Filipino, and Afghan. One of the important things was to obtain ethical approval. And I show you this slide because it, I think it's just, again, important to understand the challenges of trying to do this kind of study. So you're not just going through one ethical approval in one university, you're going through ethical approval in nine different universities. And sometimes it's not just one ethics board in one place, it's several ethics boards in one place that one needs to look at. We submitted in August uh, 22, so about uh, five weeks, six weeks after the beginning of the study, and you can see here that it took between 65 days and 240 days to get ethical approval. One of the things that you can see here, Cambridge area who thinks that they are at the top of the league, they're just about average in terms of the duration of ethical approval. One of the other things that I believe that is important to see, to understand here when you do this kind of studies, you always have surprises. And one of the surprises that almost, I think, very nearly killed the pilot study was that at some stage when we submitted for ethics approval, the ethics board at Cambridge told us, well, you need to have additional insurance to take the biological samples. And for some reason, well, we have been to the social sciences, humanities and social sciences <coughs> ethics board, but they didn't know anything about this. And so once we went to psychology, over to psychology, they said to us, well, you need additional insurance, it's going to cost you about 30,000 pounds, which we didn't have. And so I'm very grateful, I'm very, very grateful at that moment that um, the university actually sustained uh, the, the um, Global Challenges Fund helped us to find, add this money and to make this possible that we could realize the biological side of this study. Um, when it comes to what, one, one other challenge, again a very practical down-to-earth challenge is maintain quality and consistency of data collection. One of the big challenges is that if you do this kind of comparative study, you want to avoid coming to the conclusion that, for example, Vietnam, just to take the example of Vietnam again because Michael was already talking about, has lower levels of intimate partner violence than Pakistan simply because the data collection in some way was conducted in a different way and that this may have inadvertently <coughs> resulted in different response patterns. So you need, want to achieve as much consistency in the way the study is administered so that you can achieve, achieve comparability. And so we developed a research protocol. Sarah was taking the lead on this. And by the way, I should mention here that for almost everything, Sarah was kind of like the, the main person behind this and coordinating everything. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a massive, it's an absolutely massive achievement uh, that um, she kept it all together over uh, the last one and a half years. Um, Developed a fieldwork handbook where Romania and the South Africa team played a very, very important role in developing the interviewer guide, guidebook, the fieldwork guidebook. Then we had, in December a year ago, we had a meeting in Cluj where we brought all the fieldwork coordinators together to have three days of fieldwork coordinator training. So you, in this kind of study you have two levels. You first train the fieldwork coordinators and then they are going to the respective countries and then the fieldwork coordinators train the field workers and you need to make sure that this training is actually done in a consistent way. So, so Francis, it's very similar to parent training programs. You train the trainers and then the trainers need to deliver the parent training program. But in parent training it's even more complex because then the parents need to deliver to the children what they've been taught. But so this is, this is quite a similar situation, I believe. 
Um, scheduling and database management was a major challenge. So just so that you understand how this was done in the pilot study, this is not how we want to do this if we go to scale. There was a shared protocol for recruitment, scheduling and informed consent, but this was managed locally. And we think that it would be better to have, well, it needs to be managed locally, but we only had indirectly information about how the scheduling happened. The data capture was coordinated via Cambridge. We used Qualtrics, which we also know we are not going to continue to use. Um, and we had a CAPI questionnaire, so there was tablets. The questionnaire was programmed on the tablets, and the field workers took the tablets with them. Um, we had self-sensitive sections, like intimate partner violence, were self-completed. So the interviewers, and that's again following WHO guidance on this, but we also felt that this would be very important to get more valid responses, so they will complete this on their own. And in order to support participants that have lower um, reading abilities, there was a self-completed audio supported version where the participant could click on the responses, they would have an earphone and they could listen to the questions. And then also listen to the different response options and uh, select the option the, uh, that was right for them. The recruitment, just so that, again, so that you understand, we, our target was to recruit all women uh, attending checkups in the selected clinics or hospitals, that, and they were eligible if they were in the third trimester of their pregnancy, meaning between weeks 29 to 40, aged over 18 when they signed the informed consent form, having their main residence within the study geographical area, and having signed the informed consent uh, form. It's important to bear in mind here that these were convenience samples and not random samples. Uh, for the pilot study, it was less important to us to achieve strict representativeness of the samples. It was more important for us to just demonstrate that uh, we can uh, do this kind of study. Um, so let me just show you a few selected results. And I will start just with a few results, just on how the study was conducted and what we did. I think I already told you that Baseline data were collected, well, I didn't tell you this yet, they were collected early this year from February to July. So this is just the baseline survey, not the follow-up. The follow-up is still going on in some of the sites. We, 24 field workers were trained and they collected 1,208 interviews in total. We were also quite successful in collecting the biological samples and if there is this difference here of about 130, it's partly due to the fact that in some sites it just took longer for the ethics approval to, to, to come in. And so we couldn't collect the bio samples, not because the participant refused, but we, because we did not yet have the relevant... It was not the, it, the ethics approval was not the issue, the uh, insurance. Uh, so there was one country that had a very, has a very complex legislation regarding insurance and that meant that it took a very long time until this insurance could be processed and that was one of the reasons why this was low. But overall, I think it's quite encouraging to see that even with these limitations, about 85%, I think it's about 85%, almost 90% of the participants shared their biological samples with us. I, I, I would not have expected that this would have been possible at the beginning of the study. I want to show you the process of collecting the data. And I think one of the important things to bear in mind is that when you have these large number of participating places, they start in different moments in time, and the speed at which the data are collected varies between the different sites. I'm not going to, no worries, I'm not going to go into these de the details of each of these graphs, but I just want to point out just a few things. Vietnam was quite early and they had a very fast, so they were already finished by May. 
Some sites took a little bit longer to get started, but then, for instance, down here, um, the Philippines started slow, but then picked up very quickly. And you can also see in this graph the effect of major political events, respectively catastrophes. Um, here you can see, here you have the graph for Sri Lanka, where the data collection stopped, essentially, in April and May, which was due to the terrorist attacks in Sri Lanka. And, and so I think that's another inter interesting lesson to be learned, that these events can disrupt the data collection process, and you need to then think about how to respond to the situation. <coughs> so just a few substantive results. And you can see more results in the, um, in, in the report. And it, just also bear in mind, we're just beginning to scratch the surface of, of the data that we have collected. I just want to start with just, again, giving you an overview of the number of interviews that were realized. When you look at the average weeks pregnant, you can see that this is very consistent, which is actually what you want to achieve. Um, so you want to achieve that, broadly speaking, you're recruiting, on average, pregnant women that are roughly in the comparable gestational age. The mean age of the participants is also quite similar, roughly 28 years overall, a little bit younger, I think, in Pakistan, and a little bit higher in Ragama or Klujan Africa. There is big differences in the number of percentage of women that have first pregnancy, and that's, of course, linked to overall um, birth rates, going from a low of 12 uh, Low of 12% in Pakistan, meaning that almost 90%, for almost 90% of the women, it's a second or third uh, pregnancy uh, to something like, I think, um, Cluj probably is the lowest with 59%. Living with the biological father, we've been talking about a variety, variety of family structures in the different sites. This is just one example, and we will explore this more. There is big variation in the percentage of pregnant women who currently live during pregnancy with the biological father between 99% in Cluj and less than 50%, for instance, in Kingston, and close to about 50% in, in Worcester. So I want to show you just three results. The first one is about one of the things that <coughs> was important to us to measure was exposure of pregnant women to violence. And so the bottom graph here shows you the percentage of victims of intimate partner violence. And I want also to show you, so we measured three dimensions. One was intimate partner violence. The second was perceptions of violence in the neighborhood. And the third one was exp having experienced violence during childhood. So one of the things that I think that is close to our heart is not to think just about one layer of exposure to violence, but to think about polyvictimization, different layers of violence interacting in different stages of the life course, and then combining to produce a difficult environment for the pregnant mother and then also for the child. One of the things that you can see in this data as well is that there is quite a lot of variation between the sites. And so this bears back to, relates back to the issue that I was talking about in the previous session, namely the interest in average, what causes these average level differences between entire societies here, entire cities. Bearing in mind for this case here, is this not yet a representative sample. We've been looking at mental health of pregnant women because we think this is really important. And I just want to show you, again, a selection of two findings. We measured stress and we measured moderate or severe depression according to the GH, PHQ-9. And I think, again, one of the things that you can see here, when you look just at the PHQ-9, that's uh, the, the clinical cutoffs for moderate or serious uh, depression, you can see that in Kingston this is 40%, in Talai that's 38%, and then it varies, and in Ragama, for instance, and Hue, it's a lot lower, about 13%. You can also see, by the way, even if I don't show you a scattergram, that levels of feeling stressed are quite strongly correlated 
with levels of depression. And so the stress, by the way, uh, coming back to some of the things that Pascal mentioned earlier on, may have different causes. It may be caused by poverty, but it may also be caused, for instance, by things like intimate partner violence or other stresses in life. And I think one of the things that we want to learn about is which factors are most important. I was saying that we've measured beliefs in corporal punishment, and I just want to show this to you because I do believe that these attitudes and values are important. Um, here you can see, for instance, um, spanking does not harm children, or spanking is a sharp sign that parents love their children. And you can see here, for instance, at Intel Lai and in Koforidra, roughly 48% say that, well, if you love your child, spanking is actually a good thing. Now, one of the things that I learned from a conference that I attended two weeks ago in Saigon is this notion of health literacy. And I think these data show something about just low levels of health literacy. There are beliefs here, there is an expression of beliefs in what constitutes good parenting that I think at least most developmental psychologists would agree this is not good parenting. And so I think there is some, some interesting um, uh, beliefs here. So I, 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 it would be an interesting survey to be done whether anybody in this room believes that spanking does not harm children. I just want to finish with two slides just as food for thought. And, and this is just very initial exploratory analysis at the level of the entire city. So this is not Again, not individual day level data. Uh, we have a principle that Asia reminded me of a few days ago that we first um, make sure, try to make sure for the major analysis that we rec pre record our analysis so that we um, uh, have some documentation that we actually follow a hypothesis driven process of analysis. So, what I want to show you for the eight cities. Is the link between victims of sexual intimate partner violence and gender inequality according to the World Bank. This is of course absolutely exploratory, but this is the link that emerges from these data. So you can see a very strong association between levels of gender inequality and levels of exposure to intimate, sexual intimate partner violence. This may be coincidental, so it's just bear in mind, this may all be coincidental and I'm not making any firm claims. But I think what this brings down is that we need to think about these macro level drivers that may well play an important role in understanding and addressing violence during pregnancy. And I want to also show you just a second macro level graph that looks at the association between intimate partner prenatal intimate partner victimization and high stress. So one of the causal mechanisms that we believe may play an important role. And again, what you can see at the macro level, this is not individual level data at the macro level, is that the higher the proportion of women is in a city that experienced prenatal intimate partner violence, the higher is the level of stress that they report. This is not a proof of causal association, but it's just, if nothing else, it just demonstrates that there is multiple risks, multiple stresses, multiple adversities that are more likely to occur in a given society. And I think, again, that what, what this suggests is that if we want to try and address violence against women, we need to think outside just a narrow box of violence, and we need to think about broader interventions, for instance, interventions that address stress. So just some conclusions and lessons learned. Some, just some lessons learned, and this is about more the practicalities of doing this. First of all, the good news is, we, I, th I think that was the conclusion yesterday, wasn't it? We could actually do this. Yes. So, <laughs> So it's, it's, not, it, it's, it's, it's not impossible to do, and nobody knew this before, I think. I mean, there was, of course, there was the Young Life study, but that was not a first study. I think there are very few examples. 
I'm not actually aware of an example of a study that has tried to build up a birth court study in so many different places. And I think one of the things that we've come, has come out of the pilot study is that, yes, this is possible. We don't know whether it's good for our mental health, but that's a different question. Um, I think one of the things that we've also learned is that strong, a strong coordinating team is, is really essential. We were sometimes stretched to the limits and we also had to face the situation that one person, one, one person out of the three-person team here in Cambridge uh, left the team unexpectedly and at short notice it was not possible to replace that position. And then you immediately get into um, really difficult situations. Having strong, motivated and sufficiently resourced local coordination teams is also important and essential. And, and we realised this uh, in the pilot study that things like having you know, one partner to talk to but also having sufficient resources to solve issues like transport of, uh, or going to visit possible participants uh, at home if uh, other ways don't function. This is all hugely uh, important. One lesson is also, even if you try to plan for sufficient time, you need more time. And, and this is, we, we're glad that we've made it, um, but I think it's just one of the things that we've taken away is that all the planning steps require a massive amount of time. Uh, collaborative decision-making processes are essential. Just one of the things, I mean, all of faces of PBLS that I, I, I looked this up this morning when we had our first consortium meeting. And I think it was somewhere in January or February 2018. And just so that the others understand, since then, every two weeks, the entire consortium meets on Zoom and we discuss about planning issues. Every other week, we have the project management group meeting, which is a smaller group, and we do more operational planning at this level. This is a hugely time-consuming activity, and, and I just want to thank everybody who's been involved in this process, but I think it's, the essential thing is, here is that this project only can work if you have this collaborative decision-making. Uh, managing different time schedules is always a challenge, and there are always unexpected challenges that require a lot of flexibility. We saw, that's my last slide, we saw a lot of variation in economic, cultural and family structural backgrounds, which we believe is, makes the study really interesting. Well, that's not the only reason, but it makes it really interesting because it reflects a lot of the issues I think that we don't really understand, David and Harry, namely the generalizability of findings that come mostly from studies conducted in Western societies to other societal contexts, but then also about the relative weight of different factors. Yesterday, for instance, we were talking about the role of religion and spirit spiritual beliefs in, because we are doing this study in many societies that are highly religious. And so it's important and interesting to better understand, for instance, just as an example, what influence they have. You have high overall, level, overall levels of exposure to violence among <coughs> pregnant women, and this is coming from different layers that are likely to be interrelated. And finally, we have high overall levels of stress and depressive symptoms, and again, with substantial between side variations. So I'm just coming back here to my fine ultimate overall conclusion. Yes, it's possible to do this, um, but you will not be surprised to hear that it's wouldn't be easy to do. Thank you very much.